Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the 401 Access Denied podcast. I'm the host of the show, Joe Carson, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, this you know, podcast is supported and uh, delivered uh, with the help of Delinea, um, and I'm the Chief Security Scientist and Advisory CISO at Delinea. So as always, I'm joined by another amazing guest for the episode today. Uh, so welcome to the show. Welcome, Chris. Uh, you want to give the audience a little bit of background about who you are, what you do, and some interesting things about yourself. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be able to present today. I think I've heard a couple of these podcasts and they're always super intriguing and trying to learn a little bit more. Um, so a little bit of background myself. My name is Chris Katz. I'm an associate director with a consulting firm called Protivity. Um, been there for just over a decade now, um, supporting clients in a variety of different uh, things. So I started my career and my journey in the audit space. So I have a bit of background um, in an internal audit and helping clients support some of the internal controls. Um, after that, I moved into our SAP security practice. So helping clients either design their security uh, or redesign their security so that they had compliant processes, compliant roles, compliant access. Um, they're living within. We're going to talk about segregation of duties a lot. That's kind of my bread and butter in <laughs> most of my life. And then the last uh, and the majority of my career has been spent in the Dynamics, Microsoft Dynamics space, um, applying uh, security and um, SOD across X 2012, but much more recently, um, D365 Finance and mm -hmm. Operations as a ERP for a number of supply chain consultants. I am really passionate about coaching. I love sharing. I love um, trying to make sure that other people are aware and they're doing the right things and best practices. And I know that's really what today is about. Um, outside of my professional career, I have a ton of hobbies. I love sailing, mountain biking, um, being outside in general. Being in Atlanta, I'm fortunate to have quite a bit of <laughs> amazing weather to be able to get outside. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'm, I'm excited to join and share and, and see what we can do. Absolutely fantastic. And, and, you know, today's episode is all about, you know, organizations who are taking the journey around getting, you know, uh, the path to identity compliance. You know, it's just something that's very, very important for organizations. But I think we're going to really start at the groundwork, you know, how it all begins and where it all gets started. Um, so for you, can, can you tell me a little bit about what's, what's the best place or what's some of the, uh, you know, the challenges today for organizations for going down the path? Um, and what's, what's kind of some of the best places to get started or, and, and, and at least, you know, understand sometimes it's just the risks. And I think that there are, that's the number one question sure. that we get asked. And, and generally when it's, when we're just starting to help our clients support um, whatever they need to do, right? So I, you can have a consulting firm where you can even start day one and try to hit the ground running, but there's a structural element of, of groundwork that you need to lay first. And a couple of things that you need to do and understand in order to make that project as successful and last as long as you probably want mm -hmm. it to. So. One of the most common questions is, I mean, like, who do we need to have involved? It's, it's usually the first question that we get, right? So there are, we see the most success if you can get, it's three mm -hmm. groups of people in the room. If you can get IT, they're going to be involved because they understand the application. They understand some of the technical nuances of how things are going to work and how things are going to connect together. That said, I was just listening to Frank Bukovitz's podcast, I guess, uh, kind of a track back to, to one of the former ones of these. Um, and IT does not make decisions in a vacuum. They're not the end-all, be-all for who is allowed to access what or why something's allowed to happen. Um, and so bring in the business. That's part number two of people that need to be involved. Generally, it's someone at the controller level. Sometimes it's an accounts payable manager or an accounts payable or um, accounts receivable manager, as well as some people across. I do a lot of work in supply chain. That's okay. a critical element of your business. If it's fundamentally <laughs> going to to make or break you from like a, a broad perspective or from like a significant financial mm -hmm. or um, inventory movement perspective, we need them too. Um, and then the last group and often forgotten is the compliance or the audit teams. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be making decisions. That's not the reason that we involve them in some of these projects, but they do understand the groundwork, the framework mm -hmm. of what the risks are, what we should be looking out for if you're a public organization, um, and many are. Mm -hmm. What is external looking for? What are the buzzwords that, that they have? And what are the things that they're asking? And how are you going to build that into your project plan? So that you don't get caught at the very end of the project. Mm -hmm. You've done all of this fantastic work, and then there's one or two or three questions that external <laughs> tasks that totally <laughs> dismantle all this great work that you've done. And oh, now I need to 
have to go back and take another look. And I, I will talk about this later, but mm -hmm. one of those buzzwords is completeness and accuracy. And mm -hmm. that has been just a, I've seen that expand even this year quite a bit. Um, and it's challenging. Like, unless you really know what you're doing, it, it can be a real challenge to answer some of those questions. Um, I think it's a test. If you know anything, you can ask why three or four times. Mm -hmm. How many, how many times can you actually answer that? Why <laughs> with, uh, with, you know, a real understanding. So, um, generally you need those, those groups in the room and then you need to talk about what your risks are. So it's really difficult to create this kind of, and we're going to talk about this compliant mm -hmm security architecture what can users do what are we going to allow them to do what are we not it's really challenging to do that if you don't know what your risks are because mm -hmm. you don't have anything to measure it on um so you have to create that we call it a measuring stick i'm going to use that analogy probably quite a bit here but what is the what's, what's some of those kpis or measurements that you're kind of looking for what, what, what would be some of the ones that uh, the most common that you would see well some of them are sod risks so mm -hmm. it's defining you know what are the risks as far as who can create vendors and pay vendors, right? So mm -hmm. that's a, a very common risk or who can create a journal entry and, and post that journal entry. Mm -hmm. So that would be some of the first ones, right? Uh, just do you have a rule set and, and are you compliant with that rule set or not? But there's a number of other things that mm -hmm. really help set the foundation. And this is one of the other things that you want to set up front so you know, did I succeed or did I not succeed? Mm -hmm. So a lot of, some of these are checkbox items. Um, I think can take you one of the other most common requests yeah. that we get. The checkbox item is, I want my external audit to be happy at the end of the day. <laughs> That's what I care about, right? That's well, a big checkbox, but uh, maybe it's having a conversation with them, right? So identifying key strategic points mm -hmm. where you're going to get them involved and say, this is my plan. I want to talk to you here, here, and here. I want mm -hmm. to talk to you after we finish design. I want to talk to you after I finish UAT about the documentation that I need to make sure that I've collected, or it maybe even before. And I want to talk to you after I go live and, sh and show you how I'm done. There also, I mean, if you talk about just clear separation between mm -hmm. display access and update access or mm -hmm. setup access, and this goes across, I mean, almost any ERP. Like I know I have a background in SAP and, and dynamics, right? But mm -hmm. a lot of the times you're not going to have a segregation of duty risk because you can see something. I'm not yep. saying you should be able to see everything and there's certainly sensitive objects, but you, a lot of times that's the only thing that people need. Uh, Absolutely. And there's not always roles for that, right? So do you have a clear separation and do you have roles or, you know, whatever the method is, roles are common, but do you have a way of assigning users access to just mm -hmm. be able to see things? And, and maybe that's all they need. And there's licensing implications to that too. Uh, yeah. In Dynamics, for instance, if you have read access to something and that's truly all you have, you don't need an expensive license. Like the licensing is driven on security and that security mm -hmm. is driven on the access that you have. So if you're able to clearly kind of separate out, you know, display versus update access and, and just mm -hmm. grant display access, not only can you be more compliant from a audit perspective, mm -hmm. but you're also more compliant from a licensing perspective and you pay less. Absolutely. So those are common examples, but everyone needs to sit down and, yeah. and realistically define what their viewpoint is. And, and that might depend on the size of their organization too. Like, mm -hmm. You have a pie in the sky idea of least privileged access, and that's fantastic. That is a great it's, thing it's to go a, for. Absolutely, least privileged for me is is a great foundation. I think it's something that all organizations should uh, have as part of their kind of the controls and, and processes as they're going through. Um, and it even reminds me back in back in my days, you know, when I kind of met years ago working in the data center, that I was responsible for infrastructure tools, and one of my tasks would be is going into every one of the cages. And then, you know, I had my list of tasks that I needed to do. It might be upgrading a system that might be making a configuration change or some security changes or modifications. Mm -hmm. And I have my task list to do. But one of the clear things that I was not allowed to do, because you're working for massive uh, clients, you know, banks, you're working for uh, government agencies. So I was never allowed to audit my own work. So I, I couldn't just sign it off and say it was done. So, and I, I was very strict as well, is that we were not allowed to be in the same cage at the same time as the auditors. So the orders would come, um, you know, a few days or, you know, you know, a week after I would finish my task in that particular case. And I'd already moved on to the next uh, organization or next checks. And the orders would go in and they would be basically checking our work, uh, making sure that we did the right, you know, apply the configurations. So we didn't touch any other machines or systems or databases that we weren't or should not mm -hmm. have touched. And that was just kind of that whole, you know, and you use that separation, segregation duties interchangeable, you know, depending on, you know, the world you are. Uh, but that, you know, would define, because it was clear in regards to our responsibilities, they kind of referred to as the separation of duties. 
that I could not audit myself. Um, I couldn't say, you know, you know, otherwise, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're signing off your own work and you can give yourself good marks and good results. And that was yep. something that would not be accepted as part of the kind of requirements or compliance or regulations. So that was a very, very clear area. Um, as you were talking, one of the things that came to mind is, you know, is, is really at the beginning is really having uh, part of the you know, foundation of success for this is having very clear defined roles. If you don't have those roles defined uh, about, you know, w what can do, you know, to your point about having uh, the view only uh, role that I can mm -hmm. look at the data and make you know, decisions, but I can't modify it or update it. Um, how important is getting the roles very, very well defined at the beginning? Yeah, it's critical, right? So that's beyond setting the foundation for what are your KPIs for success. The, if you think about that as your measuring stick, your capability, like your your way of getting there is going to be in many applications, I would say even mm -hmm. in most, it's through roles. So sometimes those are also called permission sets or mm -hmm. entitlements or, um, you know, there's many different names, but <laughs> the fundamental element of it, it's, it's mm -hmm. a way of assigning a chunk of access to a user. Yeah. And those are, are critical, right? That's that's the only way that you're going to be able to, in many cases, assign, mm -hmm. assign that access. And so clearly defining what those roles can and cannot have mm -hmm. do a couple of things. Um, and it makes your life easier, right? Like if you had to go and pick Microsoft Dynamics has tens mm -hmm. of thousands of security objects. And for every user, if you had to go manually pick 10,000 objects mm -hmm. and then do they need read, create, update, delete access to each of those? That's, it took you forever, right? You, you'd end up where a lot of people are today, which is, all right, make Frank like Joe. Copy mm -hmm. all that access. You just copy all, all, all the same permissions. Just, yeah. But Frank may have been in the organization for 10 years and may have had like you know 10 different positions throughout that time. Mm -hmm. And there's an inheritance of all of that. So, uh, you know, me, should I, should I inherit all the same? You know, and, and one of the things organizations are very poor at is unprovisioning uh, access uh, that oh, you yes. no longer need. <laughs> well, in, in defining the roles or, mm -hmm. you know, the permission sets is a key element of that, right? So can you define in the architecture what, mm -hmm. what does accountant mean for, for your business? That yeah. doesn't, it's not the same answer for someone in manufacturing, honestly, as, as it might be for someone in, let's say, healthcare. Or mm -hmm. even we talk about, you know, multinational organizations and, and a lot of the people that I work with have that, right? So if you have someone in Europe, for instance, there's a very, um, you know, <laughs> defined set of standards, which you have to um, meet and criteria that you have to meet in order to view, you know, personally identifiable right. information. And so how are we making sure that only certain roles and appropriate roles have access exactly. to that information? Absolutely. Um, and, and to your point, you have this join or move or levers process. If you can define <laughs> your roles well enough, it should be pretty simple to understand, okay, this is an accountant, they mm -hmm. should need, maybe we're going to call that role, um, insert organization here, accountant, and we're going to define okay. what that level of access is that we would expect for our accountants. And so when I have a new accountant, that's the role that I'm going to select for that person. Mm -hmm. Or if they move in the organization, they get promoted, uh, maybe they've done a, a they absolutely crushed it. Now they're a CFO. Okay. Um, well, they can't, you know, keep all of the roles that they had to your point uh, in order to get up there. Otherwise. They're preparing journal entries. They're approving journal entries. They might be setting the standards for opening and closing periods, right? <laughs> so now all of a sudden um, you have the ability to open up a period, go back into, mm -hmm. you know, the last financial period, post a journal entry, approve that journal entry, and then all of your, your statements are mm -hmm. materially incorrect. Um, and I mean, that's a malicious example, but the other, you know, element of segregation of duties and probably more of what happens is, is not purposeful things that people are doing to you know be malicious to their organization it's a mistake it's yeah. someone had a little bit too much access and they were poking around because they thought that button looked really neat and they were just kind of curious what they what that button does and oops i forgot i was in prod um so it's honestly more more of that and trying to sort out how you're going to explain to um your stakeholders be it you mm -hmm. know your, uh, your, your shareholders or if it's external audit or, or whomever why did this person have that access how did this happen? How are we going to undo this? How much of a headache is it going to be to undo this? It, that's yeah. more of, of what we see. Mistakes, mistakes do happen. People do make mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and I think what your point is, is that, you know, if we are overprivileged or have too much rights, sometimes people might be, uh, you know, uh, might decide to try and hide that mistake. And that's where the problems occur, is that if they've got too, too much rights, 
they can change the history, they can change the auto log, they go back and, and try to just kind of hide it so that they, you know, they don't feel or look bad with their peers or bosses. And I think it's really important is that we have to get into you know, promoting that, you know, be honest and be transparent with mistakes. And it's okay, we will make them. Uh, let's just make sure that we're not at the same time, uh, you know, uh, putting that culture where people are afraid and they will hide because hiding them can cause major problems at a later. Um, oh, yeah. you know, it can cause incidents, it can cause data breaches, it can cause uh, kind of fundamental kind of, let's say, uh, castri- cascading effects where it could actually have major you know, financial penalties uh, from an auditor perspective. Absolutely. That's certainly an element of it, right? And there's a point that I think we were talking about earlier that, that I think is important to highlight too, mm-hmm. where I think a lot of where we're doing role design, we were talking about some of the KPIs mm-hmm. and where to get started and what's important to measure and, and things like that. Um, I think it's important to know where your organization is going. So a lot of times we're working with organizations and we're looking at security with a single ERP and mm-hmm. we're trying to define a rule set for a single ERP. But the odds of that really happening in the real world now, there's so many applications, right? So you might have Dynamics D365 finance operations and that's your, your primary ERP. Maybe you run your AP, your AR and your GL, but maybe you use a different solution for warehouse management and maybe you use a totally different solution for payroll and then you use a different mm-hmm. solution for XYZ, right? So a lot of organizations are moving towards what they're trying to get is a role-based access request so they can take advantage of some of the newer technologies, um, identity access management solutions, things like that. Mm-hmm. Think about that as you're doing the role design or as you're setting up your risks is how does this interact and play with others? Because eventually it probably will, or a lot of organizations oh, yeah. want it to. And if you've called, you're doing a role design, you're calling this role accountant in, um, in D365. And then in another one, you're, you're calling this other uh, <laughs> role super special accounting manager. And I've actually seen that role once. Yeah. But um, how do you know those are the same, right? Like, how do you know who needs that role and who doesn't need that role? And, and how are you going to eventually mm-hmm tie all that together into an IAM request where you have a person, a joiner Mm -hmm. that joins your organization, their accountant. How do you know, right? They need this role here or these two roles here and then that other role there and this privilege here and then access to Outlook. The onboarding process can be a nightmare if you can't map it to to people who's joining the company. If you can't really, you know, see, I I think one of the big mistakes I've seen is you're kind of referring to a lot of the custom uh, side of things they're making their roles. I've seen the problem with many organizations using the default roles and therefore not having really defined it. I've seen, I, I attended a session uh, recently at uh, DEF CON where we're talking about uh, cloud environments, uh, specifically, you know, a lot of the infrastructure uh, hosting environments. And many organizations went down you know, because they weren't quite sure about how to define those roles and then use the default ones. How big a mistake is it for an organization to do that, to take a lot of, because many cases that, it might look like a, a least privileged uh, type of role, uh, but in, in most cases, it's not. It's actually too much, too much privileged. Very common, um, and it's challenging too. I mean, it becomes a, a question of, I'll answer this in a, maybe a different way than I was originally going to. I mean, it's part of the reason that you need that foundation of mm-hmm. setting up front, what, what is your expectations? So for instance, using the out-of-the-box roles and I'm going to use Dynamics, actually I'll use both Dynamics and Mm -hmm. SAP. Um, They come with out-of-the-box roles and those are fantastic for a starting point, but you have to think about the lens of which those roles were created. So for many of, you know, for SAP and for Dynamics, they're creating these roles. They're trying to sell software, right? So they're trying Mm -hmm. to prove that, that something can work and these roles need to have access to various different things to make this work. In the real world, though, there's going to be, and I've seen across both SAP and D365 and many other organizations, or many other um, Mm -hmm. applications, those roles have either tens or even hundreds. Um, I know for accounting manager, Mm -hmm. accounts table manager, and D365, both of those roles have like 10 plus segregation of duty conflicts, and it's obvious ones. Like, Mm -hmm. it's not not things that uh, just go by the wayside. You're creating (laughs) vendors, you're creating journal entries, you're approving it, you're doing the setup. Some of them have access to the chart of accounts and maintenance over there or fiscal periods. It's mm-hmm. it's pretty um, wild. But if you think about it, like 
They're just trying to make the ERP work. So it's important to use that measuring stick that you've defined at the beginning of the project for what you want to allow. What are your risks? Use that to look at those roles um, mm -hmm. and see if they work for you or not. And in, in a lot of cases, they probably won't. But maybe there's just a couple of different things. I mean, depending on the size of your organization, if you don't, some people have 10 people, right? And, mm -hmm. and they, or sorry, 10 people that have the ability to go and focus on security. And they can design from the ground up or they can hire someone um, and purchase, you know, a set of roles that, that can be defined specifically for your organization. You can get really close to that least privileged mm -hmm. access. And other organizations are simply just too small. They don't have that team that can go in and get to that. Least it's all different access. individuals, correct? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, person might have multiple roles in the organization. So therefore it's important that they operational wise, they separate the activities. Um, exactly. So, so, so that when, you know, when they're performing one task, and I, I think I've seen that, you know, that, that kind of situation for small organizations that have individuals who do multiple things. I think sometimes that's where a lot of incidents occur or you know, security breaches occur is because they forget to close one door when they open another door um, yes. and, and separation of the operational side of their tasks. Um, because sometimes, you know, we, we get into, we, we try to multitask and do many things at once. And therefore, sometimes we might, you know, log into one system, at, you know, which might be the financial system at the same time we're logging into maybe a payable system um, or an invoicing system. And, and, and ultimately, you know, that can cause a conflict by just having those open at the same time, uh, where we have to make sure we compartmentalize those activities and not do them at the same time. And sometimes you can't. That's yeah. the other challenge. Like, you're not big enough to do it or mm -hmm. the way that your process works doesn't allow for that to happen, right? And, and so there's going to be times where you have to live with risks mm -hmm. and that becomes part of the evolution of that conversation. Like, mm -hmm. okay, well, I have a risk. I know what the risk is because I have to find it. I know that a person has it because I have some sort of tool or maybe it's a governance risk and compliance, a JRC mm -hmm. tool to measure it. And, and so you need to advance that conversation to say, well, I need to put some controls around it. I need mm -hmm. to understand what people are, that have this access are doing. I need to put a check or a balance in place, maybe. And a lot of the times, journal entries are a very easy one. Maybe mm -hmm. there's an approval. So mm -hmm. an accountant's going to prepare a journal entry, and they're going to submit it through a workflow of some sort. And the controller is going to review that and get a second pair of eyes on it. Or three-way matching. It's a yeah. great one. Uh, so just knowing uh, there's going to be times where you have to live with risk and, and knowing mm -hmm. that you have this kind of element of mitigating controls that you can use as a way to protect yourself and say, I know I have to live with this risk. I have a person that has um, wearing multiple hats. Like they mm -hmm. are in the morning, they're this person, then they back up this other person because they got <laughs> sick. And then, oh crap, the warehouse manager didn't show up. So they're going to pull inventory. Well, I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes that happens, but um, you just need to define what the controls are and those become explainable, right? And if you can do that up front rather than finding that out when you do just a random assessment at the end of the year, you'll be much more prepared to, to understand and make informed decisions on what you want to allow and what you don't want to allow. And if you're going to allow something that you wouldn't like to, what you're going to do. About it. Absolutely. It's all about really understanding your risks. It's, it's about having those defined and then looking for, you know, what, what types of controls and processes should be put in place to minimize them, you know, just to make sure that, uh, and the auditability side of things for organizations is going down all of this uh, path. And, you know, this is really, I think for organizations, it's so important to do this in order to really define the foundation uh, when they do go down that path of identity access management and privilege access management, because you're really setting that foundation for those programs and strategy, strategies to be successful, uh, because having the operational process side in place, what would you kind of recommendations uh, kind of getting started and, and, and you know, you, you define the roles, uh, you've got, you know, what types of people you need to access. Yeah, is it you know, doing regular audits? Is that something that you'd recommend? You know, different you know checkpoints uh, to make sure that things haven't kind of moved away or, or strayed uh, into something that could be uh, catastrophic. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of the times when I'm I'm talking and we have a whole presentation, we we talk about this concept of a triangle basically. Mm -hmm. So part of the triangle is defining what your your risks are, right? And we we've already talked about that, and then. The other part of the triangle is how do you have compliant roles and users? Well, the bottom part of the triangle is what are your governance processes around mm -hmm. this whole thing, right? You've defined a rule set, you've defined you know, roles and, and you've assigned those to users. How do you make sure that 
that's compliant and how are you going to deal with the constant change um and so there are a number of different governance processes that um we we typically recommend in order to protect mm -hmm. the investment some of those are user access reviews i've, I've heard them user entitlement mm -hmm. reviews uars to uers so every once in a while and, and generally it can be a i've seen it quarterly twice a mm -hmm. year yearly i haven't seen it really more than yearly Yep. How are you going to review access and make sure that it's still appropriate? And and what that's meant to catch is you, you used an example earlier. You have a person that joined the organization and then they moved mm -hmm. two or three times. Well, did you remove all the other stuff that they don't need now? So finding those elements and more and more today, I think the other one is reviewing. So you've defined maybe a risk uh, segregation of duty rule set and under that, you need to define what are the one or two or 10 or 30 different technical objects that mm -hmm. align to your ERP that allow you to do that. So in SAP, that could be a transaction code and then the authorization objects underneath it. In Dynamics, those could be menu item displays or menu item actions or data entities. But what's happening now is a lot of these ERPs are moving to the cloud um, mm -hmm. and you're taking updates every, for Microsoft, you have to take an update at least twice a year. They're releasing them quarterly. Thank goodness that used to be like they were releasing every <laughs> month. And so just trying to stay on that cadence was a challenge. But a lot of the ERPs are moving that way. And part of those updates, there's new security ways or new mm -hmm. features and functions. And you have to enable that with security, right? So are you thinking about those updates that you're taking? Mm -hmm. Are you thinking about what are the new ways of doing things? And are you reincorporating that back into the rule set? And that should be part of Everyone knows you have to do regression testing to make sure that the yeah. system isn't going to work and the business isn't going to yell at you day one. But what people don't know is, or aren't maybe thinking about is, how are you assessing those new security objects and putting them in your rule sets so that you don't find that, oh, I just had 300 new objects this year. I wonder what those do. Um, <laughs> but you're not assessing them, right? Yeah. And um, the object you may have been using in the past might be gone. <laughs> it might be redefined uh, into something else. And, um, and I've seen also a lot of times where you, you, you may have applied a configuration that you uh, kind of been using and for some reason during it didn't hold and all of a sudden you, you're back to the defaults and those defaults are not always the ideal that you want to be in yeah ex yeah precisely <laughs> you have to be really careful with it and it's just making yeah. sure you're looking and taking the time to think through it and it's easy um, because there's you know everyone has many things in their plate you could be multitasking to forget about that mm -hmm. but um making sure that you you set the foundation what are those governance processes and, and the rule set review as part of taking updates is one of those doing user access review is another um and maybe doing a segregation of duty review every mm -hmm. um, as often as you can really but i have some clients that will do it um you know once a quarter uh, i have mm -hmm. others that will do it once a year because they have to do it for external audit but i'll tell you the best ones they're running it almost every day and Basically, they'll they'll set it up and they use a tool that Delenia just purchased called FastPath, and and they'll say, look, tell me any new risks that I have in my organization that don't have mitigating controls, and only send me the new ones. Like, don't send me the ones that have mitigating controls because I want to know about it. And it's another way of just getting informed, basically as soon mm -hmm. as you can, so you know within a day of something happening, and you can do something with that. So, how often are you looking? Can you use those things that aren't? It doesn't have to be another 10 minute task or 20 minute or two hour task that you're doing every day, but can you, can you set something up so you can be alerted so that you know to do something about it? Um, and, and that way you can tackle it up front rather than trying to look back and see everything that John Doe did with uh, yeah, his absolutely. elevated access. Absolutely. That's yeah, so one of the, kind of the definitions is, is having that governance side of things is that I want to see, I want to you know, show me, you know, I've created a baseline. Uh, show me, you know, where that baseline is no longer kind of being met. Um, mm -hmm. So that differentiation, and also show me kind of the, the the audit history, so I know basically, you know, going to be able to go back and check and see um, if we did it this way ten times in the last time, why was it different, uh, and then be able to see the difference difference between the process and the flow. Yeah, and there's more and more information. Like SAP's mm -hmm. always had some really good information. You can look at some of the stat data tables and see what what users were doing. Other applications, Microsoft mm -hmm. Dynamics D365 for especially finance and operation is that's historically challenging. Um, there aren't great audit logs for. I mean, there are for journal entries, but they're not for some of the master data changes. And Microsoft's now starting to release. And um, I know you'll you'll ask a question. We'll share some information, blog posts, things like that. But Mm -hmm. They're starting to release some of that um, in the form of what's called telemetry data. So yeah. how are you tracking that and, and storing it so that you have it when you need it? 
and in other than you know using some of the database logging features that have um some kind of known system performance drawbacks if you're not careful about what you're tracking so um, part of it's just staying educated um and, and knowing what you should be looking for and trying to set some of those things up in advance rather than trying to go dig for something that might or might not exist at the end of the year and you spend your entire um winter break looking for uh through compliance logs rather than spending time with i don't know your family or um doing the hobbies that you love absolutely and what what how, how important is training on is as part of all of this you know because you know a lot of times that's sometimes one thing that people forget is is you know here here's a solution here's a process here's a control go get started how important is training as part of this entire you know journey well it's pretty difficult to execute a process if, if you don't know what you're supposed to do so i mean it's 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 very important. I, I think the 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 uh, the part that people overlook with training mm-hmm. is just how much is available out there. I mean, like obviously you need to train on on your particular process, and there's going to be certain ways that it works for your business that are that could be different than others. But there are so many great tools. Um, like almost any if you're using a tool for let's say user access reviews, honestly, there's generally provided from the vendor uh, some great you know training mm-hmm. things, and and start there. Also, I mean, use your user acceptance testing if you can. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you're going to go through some element of that. Use that as a training. Um, Record it. Create those desktop procedures Mm -hmm. so that people have references. I mean, people are busy. That's not their entire day isn't thought about or they're not thinking about Mm -hmm. compliance. So um, it's it's critical, but it's it's not just the the initial training. It's also making sure that they have the right things at their disposal. Uh, Maybe it's a desktop procedure uh, as a quick reminder of of how to do something Uh, because Oh, what you might find is someone doesn't know how to do something and rather than asking, uh, which always ask, it's better to ask and then you can figure it out together rather than not asking, you're doing it on your own. But Absolutely. Uh, if you don't have the right training, you might find that people are just rubber stamping things. They're, yep, cool, this looks great. I'm going to rubber stamp it and we're going to send it on its merry way. And, and then you find you know, compliance issues in, in that regard because someone either didn't take the training or they... They did take the training and they forgot because they were taking the training on one one screen, but then they were checking not paying attention. Yeah, not, not the paid. focus. The focus is yeah. So, mm-hmm. so what, what's what's some of the things that, you know? How do you stay up to date? What's some of the resources and tools and training you know places you go to? Is there blogs that you can recommend to people? Yeah, there, there are so many different things. I'm going to start generic and I'll get specific um, with my focus area and dynamics. But I think that the most overlooked thing is some of the communities that exist out there. Mm-hmm. There's communities for almost any ERP that, that you can dream of, and especially the big ones. They have really robust communities. They're constantly sharing knowledge on challenges that people have faced or, you know, from a security perspective, what they've done or, you know, a tool that they use that was really neat. It's fantastic how much people are willing to share. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they love sharing. Um, and so I think looking for those communities for for your ERP or for your profession are fantastic resources. Um, there's also blogs, ERP specific or or not. Um, I know Microsoft has actually quite a few and Microsoft themselves will host those as well as you're going to find almost in an ERP, there's going to be a couple people that know, copy wise too, honestly, that know a lot, right? They're, they're a true subject matter expert and they're mm-hmm. going to be writing blogs because they're fascinated by what the products can do or different nuanced ways of doing that. And that person or those two people or three people will often have a blog that they write on their own that they host. You'll find those if you look through the community form, you're going to start to notice, man, I'm seeing Alex Meyer's name all the time on these blogs. <laughs> I bet he knows something about dynamic security because he's answered Mm -hmm. 17,000 questions Um, and he's a fantastic resource a Microsoft MVP that writes a lot of blogs for dynamics and and I've learned a ton I I still constantly learn from his blogs and I'm sure we can drop some of these links um, in uh, the show notes but we will do absolutely um, there's fantastic resources out there and people that are sharing it Um, and then um, even just talking internally uh, a lot of the times I think there's a lot more knowledge that's inherent to organization than people realize. And they just don't ask the question because they're nervous or because they, they don't want to be seen as just not knowing everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of the times you can ask the question internally and someone probably right sitting next to you has an answer or it's hanging away from an answer and you don't have to go. Send a, a, a it's, one of, it's one of my, my always big time advices is that for people is never be afraid to ask for advice Absolutely. or ask for help, ask for help as well. So. Um, because, you know, 
we always try to surround ourselves with really smart, intelligent people. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's just uh, being uh, kind of strong enough. You'll always find that majority of people are always willing to help. Um, what, what, what some of the conferences you recommend? Is it, were there one place or uh, where would people see you at uh, if uh, there was a conference around this? Yeah, I'll, I'll be at, um, so there's two major um, conferences that happen for Dynamics every year, at least in the United States. Um, the next one's going to be Microsoft Dynamics Community Summit. Um, that's mm -hmm. coming up here in October in San Antonio. Going there, I have a, a few um, folks on my team that are presenting on various different security topics, how to get started, 10 common mistakes, mm -hmm. kind of things. So excited to, to see them and, and watch them here in Summit in October. Um, and then there's um, a Dynamics Community Roadshow. Um, it goes to different offices, or sorry, different cities. So excited to see that as well. Um, there's also Dynamics Con. It's making a, um, a rise, really. I mean, I said making a rise. It's been around for, for quite some time. But they're starting to, to do more um, in-person activities. Um, and I know they were live for a little bit during the pandemic. And even after a couple of years um, after, they were doing kind of webinar-based events. But mm -hmm. they're back in person, too. So there's some amazing conferences coming up that there's just so much to, to learn and, and people to meet. And you have to know, you know, it's easier to know. And, and you can see who you should be asking questions to or oftentimes you didn't know you had a question but someone else yeah. asks it and then you think about it and you're like wow i really wanted yeah. to know that I, I that's fascinating yeah. i'm a big big fan of the communities uh because it, it's always a kind of place to bring people together and so many people end up having the same questions to your point is that sometimes you might not think about it in, in the same context uh but it's something that's always important chris it's been awesome having you on i think for the audience so we're really going to get a, a really uh, valuable knowledge here about some of the things that they should be thinking about some of the things that may have not been you know the questions that uh, you've answered today uh, will be great value for them. So, Chris, it's been awesome having you on the podcast and really looking forward to uh, talking with you more in the future. And for the audience, if you want to catch up with Chris, you know, definitely keep an eye out for some of the communities and uh, we'll make sure that all of the uh, blogs and additional information is in the show notes for the episode. So, Chris, it's been awesome having you on. It's, it's, it's been a great discussion. Likewise, my pleasure. And for the audience, also, you know, what's some of the best ways for the audience if they want to reach out and connect with you and ask questions? Yeah, um, we can drop my, my email um, in the, the show notes below. Mm -hmm. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's a, a great way to, to find me and get a hold of me and, and see what's happening, where I'll be. I try to share some some great blogs um, as well there from security and, and Microsoft D365. So I think those are usually the best two places to find me. Awesome. Fantastic. So everyone, it's been awesome having uh, Chris on. Uh, for everyone out there, make sure you tune in every two weeks for the 401 Access Tonight podcast. Um, I'm the host of the show, Joe Carson. Uh, stay safe, take care, and see you on another episode soon. Thank you.